moved from frontal class um, teaching to off-campus distance uh, online teaching. Uh, in many cases, it was already announced uh, um, uh, already that uh, full term will also be already delivered by remote teaching. Uh, I know some universities in the US that already say the full term is already uh, going to be uh, done by, uh, uh, by remote teaching. Now, uh, this, uh, this uh, transformation was not easy. Issue like the adjustment of the course material, the training of the faculty, the availability of the technological infrastructure, and the inadequacies of the present technology, uh, whether we suffered even in this, uh, uh, this session, we suffered from some uh, glitches of the technology. Uh, technology is very far from being, being perfect. Definitely created substantial obstacles. Uh, now, another thing, we talk about equality, uh, major gaps in the uh, availability of uh, internet resources among uh, different students definitely uh, is aggravating social inequality. Uh, definitely there are, uh, uh, and uh, this is something we, we face even uh, in Israel, when you talk that many students do not have access to the internet or the availability of computers at home to the same extent that other students. And the, the, the vision is uh, very much conforms to, uh, to social economic lines and uh, definitely increase uh, uh, inequality. And especially if uh, next year classes will be run online uh, we are going to see definitely uh, uh, underprivileged students or underprivileged as far as their access to um, higher education. Now, what I'm afraid is that the pressures for continuing this model of teaching uh, will mount, will have many more, uh, much more pressures even after the COVID-19 pandemic is over. Uh, there are very strong forces that try to push the higher education system in this direction for a long time. Uh, just um, a title for my item from uh, um, a blog from the World Economic Forum, the Davos uh, Forum, a few weeks ago, I, I just quoted uh, the title, COVID-19 is driving a long overdue revolution in education. A long, a long overdue uh, revolution in education. So, um, and the article compares uh, this revolution to industrial revolution uh, in fact, I think that this is uh, uh, not um, a spurious comparison. I think that what we see at the beginning, um, or maybe uh, um, uh, a major increase in the industrialization of higher education, I think the comp comparison to the, to the um, industrial revolution is not, um, uh, is not completely um, foolish. By the way, there was um, um, another study that uh, uh, the World Economic Forum in Davos uh, published is the fact that uh, this uh, online teaching is much more effective. They already have done a very quick uh, study and it's much more effective than the, the regular frontal class uh, uh, thing. Uh, I, I don't know the, the details of that, but it, it looks very, very doubtful. Now the economic advantages of uh, this model are obvious. The effort in preparing the course material can be used over and over again on much larger um, scale than before. The elimination of the need for physical proximity made the deliverance of the teaching much cheaper. And for many students, it makes participation easier. The efficiency involved in this new development will surely create forces to move more and more in this direction. Uh, this could mean smaller faculty. But I'm convinced that even um, uh, technology improves dramatically and uh, um, it will allow um, a much more a smoother uh, interface uh, uh, with the students, more active interface. Uh, it's not going to be the same thing. Uh, the very concept of a class, the importance of eye contact. Eye contact, uh, I do have eye contact with some of you right now, but again, it's not the same thing like physical eye contact. I, I know that I may be uh, uh, conservative, but I think it's not, it's not the same thing. The ability of the uh, kind of, um, uh, of feedback that you can get is definitely uh, uh, not the same thing. And very important element of the educational process will be lost to a large extent when we move to this uh, online uh, teaching. Uh, this industrial uh, mode of teaching can be adequate. Can be adequate. Uh, the purpose of if the educational, uh, the, the purpose of educational purpose is to provide training in specific well-defined skills and knowledge training the workforce. If you, what you tend to do is training the workforce, they're probably having a, 
something which is uh, um, prepared uh, online uh, classes could do a, a relatively good uh, good job. But there is uh, what, what I believe is something. There is another important goal of the university system, uh, and uh, which is sometimes is not put in the front. But I think it's um, it's extremely important, and that's not training a specific and specific. Uh, uh, skills, specific um, um, uh, jobs, preparing things for the uh, uh, people for the workforce, is creating and maintaining a community of scholars. Community of scholars, which is multidisciplinary, multi-age, a community whose goal is to ask questions and to try tentative answers. Now, I mean something which is much more than just interaction between people of the same um, um, in the same the same field are questions which are not necessarily part of a planned research program, uh, but questions which arise, for instance, uh, during a casual encounter at a corridor or the coffee machine. I find it very difficult to imagine uh, a Zoom coffee machine encounter. Um, when I say community of scholars, uh, by the way, I, I want to emphasize, I also mean a community of scholars in which many of the students are also members, probably for many of them temporary members, uh, but still, uh, I think that participating in such a community can be an um, enriching intellectual experience to students, which is no less important than formal um, structured, uh, structured instructions. Let me tell you a little story from our personal experience. My very first class at the, uh, at the university, Hebrew University in mathematics, um, was actually a recitation section with a TA. He became a professor later, he's retired now. And uh, uh, about the class, I had a question, the very, the very first hour. So I approached him after the class and asked him the question. He thought for a minute. He said, I do not know the answer. But do you have some time? Let, let's go to my office and let, let's try to think about it. And of course, within 20 minutes, we, we, solved, the, uh, we solved the problem. But I still remember the feeling of uh, the fact that he considers me a partner in this intellectual venture in trying to solve to solve problems which which are interesting, and I think that uh, um, I, I know that even in the present system, uh, it's very it's relatively it's not very common for students to have this experience, but I think that if we move to that industrial uh, uh, phase of higher education, we're definitely going to lose uh, even this uh, little bit of. Uh, um, community of scholars feeling uh, for, uh, for the students. Uh, it definitely, I think that uh, it definitely exists in the present system and I think that it would be very sad to kill it. Uh, I think that uh, the COVID, uh, the, uh, maybe this transformation to, um, to industrialized higher education was going uh, to happen anyway. The economic um, uh, pressures are definitely there. But definitely the COVID-19 pandemic is precipitating it. And uh, it definitely that uh, um, uh, change will not be hospitable to the idea of the community of scholars. Now, I, I want to, um, to quote, almost to end, uh, from a quote from an article, unfortunately it's only liberal, by uh, Sachi Zamir, published in uh, Aretz in, uh, this uh, weekend. Uh, he's a professor of English literature in my university about the experience on the online teaching, his experience on online teaching. By the way, uh, just uh, I read first the title of that article. It say, uh, they stopped being a class. Am I still a teacher? Um, and uh, the quote from the end of the article, soon we shall return to classrooms. He's, op he's uh, optimistic that we will return to, class to classrooms. But the cuckoo bird of online teaching using the pandemic uh, to lay our eggs, already laid it, uh, eggs in our nests. We shall soon return to teaching that requires physical presence. But we started hatching eggs that with all their uh, interesting value contain something violent and foreign. Uh, are we just uh, um, uh, coachmen bemoaning the arrival of the train or the motor car or the Luddites uh, trying to destroy the mechanical uh, looms? Uh, Maybe there is a, a little bit of what, of, of what I think about it. But uh, I think that we try to preserve, even in this brave new world, um, a precious mode of human intellectual endeavor. 
that uh, there is a danger of uh, the aftermath of the uh, COVID-19 uh, could actually disappear. Thank you very much. My microphone. Thank you for sharing uh, all these views about um, higher education. Uh, let me start by, by asking the, the question you talked at the beginning about uh, the decrease in the enrollment. Uh, do you see the main cause of that due to uh, financial problem of people, of students, or do you see it as due to the online teaching or a mixture of both? Uh, I think it's a mixture of, of, of everything. I know, I know students, again, I don't think there was a systematic study, but I know even for talking to some students, I know some students simply dropping, um, dropping school because they, um, uh, I talk about continuing students, mm -hmm. because of the, um, uh, they're frustrated with uh, uh, the, online, the online teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, I know students, uh, I heard, Pizza, I don't know personally, I heard students that are reluctant, uh, especially in the US, students, that, uh, potential students that graduate from high schools that uh, said, this is not the kind of um, um, experience we were expecting. Uh, they know already, that, you know, the schools that are trying to enroll already tells them that at least the fall semester, maybe the whole next year will be online. So mm -hmm. they, uh, um, they say, this is not the kind of experience uh, uh, I was hoping to get. Well, for some of them, it's not the, the intellectual uh, uh, interaction. Probably for some of them, it's the social, the parties, if you say, or whatever. Doesn't mm -hmm. matter. But uh, they say, okay, we, I'm going to postpone my, uh, I'm going to postpone my enrollment. Uh, for some of them, that's uh, definitely economic uncertainties. They definitely, they, they were okay. depending. Uh, even if they, you don't see the issue of uh, tuition, is the fact that uh, they were expecting to uh, make living by by, for instance, uh, working in, um, as waiters in restaurants. Uh, I don't know what the situation uh, in France now, for instance, or other places. In Israel, the restaurants opened uh, um, last week, uh, Miri, or... Um, but um, um, still many restaurants did not open. So people are saying that, and definitely on a much smaller scale. So, so the kind of positions available to students disappear. So students are, uh, so the economic consideration is definitely there. Okay. Are there uh, uh, questions, comments? Yep, uh, Andres? Yeah, I have uh, a couple of... Yes? Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, uh, to what degree is this, you know, uh, COVID-19 deepening an already existing situation within universities? That's my first question, because in many ways, in several countries in the world, and especially with private universities, there was already a decrease in enrollment that was happening for, you know, other reasons um, that are kind of, uh, uh, you know, difficult to, 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 to assess. And um, the, this question is related to, uh, you mentioned at some point that uh, especially, you know, you know, not the high ranking university in the United States, but mostly the lower ranking will be in deep trouble or in the world. Now, um, in, in what sense do you think that uh, all this, you know, model of uh, competition between universities that has kind of become worldwide with all these indices, uh, you know, the Shanghai Index and this one index and many universities changing completely the way they, you know, they do research, but the, the way they hire, and the way they, you know, organize or the fusion you know, between universities. To what degree has this created a loss of uh, the original sense of universities that is now being perhaps put into question and perhaps given an opportunity? Many of the higher ranking universities perhaps did not engage in this little game, but a lot of smaller universities started playing this game of, uh, you know, hiring this uh, you know, few, making these little fusions just in order to increase the ranking and therefore, you know, get perhaps more resources or more prestige or, or something like that. And uh, in many cases, it actually led, I, I believe, of course, it depends on the cases, to a corruption of, uh, you know, of, 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 of the quality of research and the corruption to, to quality of what universities were doing. So um, do, you, do you see a role for this crisis to engage in a change, uh, you know, stopping that sort of uh, insane competition 
and uh, maybe offering some kind of a you know role for solidarity perhaps between universities or bringing up some new things in order to get out of this of this crisis well uh, um, again I, I don't have a, a, a simple answer for that uh, definitely as I said many universities will suffer and uh, uh, w w whenever there is a, a major drop a, a very sudden major drop in the resources available to universities that actually um, creates a very bad atmosphere for uh, uh, you know, university is a very long-term uh, project. Um, I don't think that, um, uh, I mentioned universities, you know, medieval universities that stopped operating, but they, they restarted again. Um, I don't think except for, uh, I don't know, the Catholic Church or the Greek Orthodox Church, I, I don't know an institution that has got such continuous um, existence for, uh, I don't know, 900 years or, um, so, uh, but, so it's a very long-term, uh, a very long-term project. And uh, um, by the way, uh, you hear voices that say that it's already obsolete, that without change, it's, uh, you should close it down. But uh, of, of course, I, um, uh, I disagree very strongly. Uh, but under the pressure of a crisis, uh, you can make very um, quick decisions, which are not very well thought. So you can see things that uh, in order to, uh, to uh, um, increase the competitive edge, of a, um, of a university, you can very quickly, for instance, think about this online uh, uh, online teaching. For instance, one possible effect, I hope you know, is that, um, you know, the, the online teaching, uh, or this mess online teaching, actually calls for, in some sense, for, um, uh, for superstars. I'm not talking about academic, uh, intellectual superstars, but uh, uh, the performers. Uh, and you know, and the the the, um, the kind of um, um, uh, the qualities you need for uh, a teaching in a relatively small class uh, is, is somewhat different than the one in which in which you make a show, uh, televised show, for you know hundreds of um, uh, hundreds of students. And uh, uh, so, for instance, you you uh, you would prefer having faculty which are super performers, for instance. So you can have uh, many uh, quick. Of um, not well thought uh, decisions, which will definitely have a very uh, um, sad um, long term effect on the uh, on the future of the uh, of the universities. Now we were hinting that maybe uh, some some mode of cooperation uh, between universities, which are now very competitive, could be um, um, uh, could be worked out. But that depends to a large extent on. Uh, um, uh, it depends on the uh, national system in, in, in each uh, uh, in each country, but definitely it is something that uh, uh, could be could be helpful. It's it's not so easy. I mean, the politics of higher education is uh, within this uh, um, is um, um, is of course politics, which is not different than uh, uh, the national politics. Uh, it's somebody that was uh, unfortunately a player in that. Uh, in that game, uh, I can tell you a lot of stories about it. But uh, uh, so, getting this kind of cooperation is not uh, is not easy. But definitely, it could be uh, it could be very helpful. Okay, thank you. May I ask a question? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, I will perhaps try to uh, to see the situation somewhat differently. First. I would like to go back to how the smaller universities actually operated before this crisis. And uh, truth to be told, many of these universities were not the universities in the sense that you have described. Did not really uh, put that individual attention to actually teaching the students. Rather, many of them, uh, I think, have worked exactly on the model that you uh, have now mentioned on the teaching performers. Uh, we have written letters of recommendations for our young, younger colleagues, and even it started in my generation. Uh, a, a large part of their CV is to have something called teaching philosophy. And teaching philosophy, uh, the one that is 
mostly appreciated is not the one that will uh, tell us how to uh, to help an individual student uh, improve, but it is exactly this teaching performance. So I think that this crisis, as often is the case, actually accepted something that perhaps already existed. And maybe this uh, division that has come between the universities that can sustain and the other ones that cannot sustain is something that actually was already there, sadly. I think that uh, also would like to mention something. I very much liked how you made the parallels with history. So I would also like to make one historical parallel. Uh, Newton uh, had something that is called as Anna, uh, Anus Mirabilis, one year in which he did basically everything that we know him for. And he did this in the solitude because he had to uh, leave the Cambridge University because of another much later episode of plague. So there is some room in, uh, in what we are seeing now to actually individualize our teaching rather than to massify our teaching. I think that this type of uh, media perhaps can be used for the opposite of what, the, uh, what this negativity that you mentioned is. Perhaps we can give more individual attention, we can give more individual projects, people can think in their own time. And uh, well, in the younger generations, I have seen that in some examples, including our own daughter who uh, has blossomed in this environment. Now she doesn't need to be told that things have to be underlined in red and in green, but she can uh, do things in her own way. I imagine that in your family, I know you have uh, grandchildren who are very individual. So this type of environment is perhaps good for some students and uh, I think it would be very interesting if those among us who are real specialists in teaching would take the time to see how we can actually take the occasion to, to uh, take the good parts of this rather than to sink into uh, the bad parts which are very dangerous as you pointed out. Uh, well, of, of course, there is there is a lot of truth of what you say, and uh, but um, uh, what I'm afraid is that um, the benefits that you talk about probably could be shared by a very small group of uh, of students. Uh, you mentioned my uh, grandchildren, and uh, you are um, uh, at least I share with you some of the concerns of my uh, you know my English um, grandchild grandson. Yes. And, and uh, his problems in school, and he's flourishing now. It, 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 <laughs> that's what I had in mind. <laughs> but uh, he's flourishing at home. But um, uh, but but the number of students that actually could benefit from something like that is probably relatively small. And uh, you're talking about uh, people that uh, their uh, own background, that uh, their parents can provide. Uh, exactly this uh, support, if, even if the you know the system, education system provides some some way of uh, uh, online teaching, still the support of the home and the uh, involvement of the parents become much more crucial in that uh, uh, in that environment. So um, uh, so I think that uh, if that system become the major way in which education is being delivered, including higher education. I think that uh, you are seeing widening of, uh, of the social economic gaps. I think that the benefit that you get from coming from, from a well-to-do family will increase enormously if that become much more uh, the method in which you, uh, uh, the main way in which education, including higher education is being delivered. Probably well, right. Yes. Yeah, I have one. one yeah, uh, I, I completely agree both with Mirna's uh, in points, but, but and also your answer in general. But there is a role for solidarity in the formation of small groups of students who may actually bridge, you know, make, you know, kind of a uh, erase up to some to some point these sort of uh, divides and uh, inequalities. I have one example of a group. So I'm teaching a basic, you know, introductory set theory, uh, which is a large class, and normally it's, you know, 60 students and so on. So they have to grow, work in groups. One group is an interesting example of what you're saying. So in that group, there are four students. Two of them are physics students 
really good, you know, we have very good physics program in our university and uh, they are taking this set theory course. They're reading, you know, they're asking me about uh, your work in a set theory and physics, Menachem, that kind of students. And at the same time, there is in the same group, one woman student whose family is from Leticia. It's a town in the, in the border with Brazil, in the Amazonian forest in Colombia. Low, very low internet access. She cannot follow, uh, you know, online classes, but, she, but they are recorded and she can follow. Well, with that group, they work together. You know, the two physics students, one math student who is good from Bogota, and this uh, woman student from Leticia. And, uh, you know, they had to give presentations of their, uh, you know, the group's um, work this week, this past week. And I was amazed to see how they actually helped each other of course, it's, you, know, you do not get exactly the same kind of a presentation and so on individually from those kind of physics students and the, the, the woman from Leticia, but they were working, working together. That's, to me, it was an example of solidarity I had never seen, uh, because maybe it happened, maybe it happened already, but we didn't see it because I had no way to track it. Of course, it's just an extremely small example, you know, as small examples are, just, you know, like, uh, as, as you said, Menachem, there is the example of, uh, of your grandson. It's also a very specific example, or, or Ada. But I think uh, working toward this sort of a group solidarity, if you can push it in some sense, it won't change uh, completely things, but you can, you know, uh, at least in that case, it created uh, something that I had not seen uh, before. So somebody, somebody from the Amazonian forest being able to engage it doesn't, you know, create some kind of presentation that somehow uh, was good. Of course, this is just uh, to mention the possible role of solidarity, and it is just a, a small example. It doesn't change the whole, the overall picture, perhaps. Okay. And, uh, uh, I, I definitely agree. I mean, there definitely, uh, uh, you know, these initiatives which try to uh, to make. Um, uh, I mean, because of the COVID nineteen now. Uh, it's a fact of life that uh, that online uh, remote teaching is uh, studies being done. So trying to uh, to create modes of, of uh, cooperation or solidarity that uh, definitely facilitate uh, interaction definitely something that is very desirable. And I hope to see as much as possible of this. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much. I think. Uh, we're coming to, to an end. Thank you for all this, uh, something to think about, about uh, education and all that, and the future of education. So unfortunately, there's the next talk uh, by Esther. Hi. Uh, so maybe I'll put the film back on so we can film you, yes? No, no, you don't have to film it. Um, uh, no, I just wanted uh, to add to some of your to what uh, Menachem was saying, but also to you. Mira, this is not formal yeah. part, right? Uh, it was already closed, official session, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's very, <laughs> so it's an off the record. So yeah, me personally, I, I, I really feel um, like you, and uh, actually I was teaching in the Zoom for uh, the entire time of the Corona, which was, uh, at times successful, at times painful, but okay. And then I made the work about uh, the loss of uh, eye contact that, uh, in the Zoom and, you know, as a kind of, uh, what is this, uh, what is this kind of future where there is no eye contact? So that's on the one hand and, um, but then on the other hand, I must say that I feel that we are in a situation of transition, which is already happening even before the coronavirus. And um, we don't, I mean, maybe us and even our children are not accustomed to this, uh, the digital, but it seems that there is an infrastructure that was already there uh, and uh, that was waiting to exercise itself as a kind of a means for um, production of uh, knowledge, solidarity, and or antagonism, of course, and uh, competition. And uh, 
And the fact that, uh, that we feel that it is lacking is, um, yeah, maybe uh, Don Quixote, you know, it, it has, um, we are not, we didn't live in this world, the world that is about to come. And we don't, we don't have, uh, we actually, we are not natives to this world. And possibly um, uh, with the advantages and disadvantages, the future generations would have to figure out a way, you know, because uh, for instance, uh, maybe eye contact uh, would be able to, re surely eye contact just technically would be able to be resolved by technology, but of course, it can be an eye contact that is not in the, not necessarily uh, share the same physical space, but um, these are, uh, we can take uh, parallels from other areas where the industrial revolutions, for instance, uh, change uh, our relationship to objects or to, uh, to crafted things. And uh, I think, uh, there is, we are in, a, in the midst of, uh, of a revolution, a, a revolution that also changes fundamentally the, what we need to know and how this knowledge is going to be, uh, um, I mean, uh, represented and added via, I don't know, this or other AI devices that are going to augment our knowledge, aid our presence and our memory, etc. And these are all take part in the digital. So in a way, we are now serving not only Google that are going to know much more about speech recognition, etc. Et and all the future AI technologies, but the, eventually there will be a new generation and this generation uh, would feel at home in some kind of future digital that we feel completely alienated from. And there we will, uh, uh, and I think the COVID-19 have given us a glimpse of uh, this uh, future. And it's in, even before the, uh, what uh, our, because it shows us the state of technology that was before also the state of surveillance the state of uh, 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 capitalism, of surveillance, etc., things that uh, that that may that became transparent in this uh, situation, whereas we can experience this as a kind of a, a crisis. And of course, I see, me personally, that's part of what I experience. But uh, it is, I think, uh, they're, they're connected to it. Uh, there is a future that we cannot uh, uh, join right now because we were not born to the right moment. We can only see it from far away, like... Uh, well, what, what, what you're saying that we are the, we are the coachmen, that when the car arrives, we, we can't learn to drive the car. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we can, we can uh, say that, uh, you know, that uh, there would be a problem with the horses and that, uh, you know, in England and... We, we will be able to, to watch it to some extent and we can, we can analyze it, but we analyze it as we are never going to be natives, or most of us, uh, including probably some phase generation, but definitely the technology is developing in such a, a pace and these technologies, they are there to change and they are there to be used. They, they, they are going to stand in reserve until the moment that they are going to evade completely our lives. And, you know, so uh, like the, the digital revolution is something that uh, we are going through already and it comes with a lot of other technologies. And I think, uh, uh, yeah, we, we look on that and we see also the parts of humanity that is fundamentally changing uh, right now. Um. <laughs> yeah. It looks like your next pro sounds like your next project, Miri. Uh, I, can... I did a project on that recently, actually. But, um... <laughs> people people but, uh, don't know me. Miri is a very, uh, very successful, very interesting artist, but also a, a past mathematician. 
<laughs> well, uh, why are you telling us this? She will announce her in her talk on Friday if she ever sends me her abstract. Huh? What? <laughs> if you send me your abstract, <laughs> then I can say this on Friday <laughs> rather than now. Uh, Mary, just a very short answer. I don't want to uh, burden uh, the other people. Uh, a very short answer. Um, I, I think you're right. I think the, uh, the digital revolution, or whatever you want to call it, is, is here. Uh, but um, but I think that even in the old system, the, there were some um, unique, precious things that uh, more than, that uh, in some sense should be preserved to a large extent. So the issue is how, how do we preserve them? That's, that's my, my message. I hope it uh, will be able to, pre to be preserved under the, the new technology of, uh, you know, of surveillance and of, uh, because you can imagine, for me, for instance, I must tell you, I was giving a, a, a class and the academy in, in Bezalel, and the, the class was online. The academy demanded that I should uh, record the class and, and that they should be online. And I said, no, I'm not ready to do that. And they asked me why, and I said, because uh, this is a, a class, is something intimate where people should, uh, and the teacher maybe even, should uh, be, feel comfortable to say something stupid also. And yeah. so that this doesn't remain, and so people can, can feel, and if I put it online, then I violated something very, uh, and this is art classes, yeah, I, I violated something very fundamental about the contract that I have with the student. Yeah, it's not, but then, you know, a counter, um, uh, a counter claim would be, do you follow all your rules as a teacher? Maybe you are violating other uh, rules of conduct and we want to surveillance you. And this is actually a tension that exists right now in the, in, in the teacher position. So we know that uh, 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 there is a kind of a protocol, a technological protocol that is replacing a human protocol. So instead of us, each of us having a slightly different moral model, but everybody exercising this model, we are going to have a unique uh, surveillance system that are going to uh, judge us according to principles of uh, criteria of how to be, um, let's say, according to uh, this or that uh, political um, role that we have to that we have to play. I don't know if what maybe it's confusing what I said, but um, no, no, yeah, I see exactly. What, let, let me just add um, one. Uh, one, one remark, for instance, one thing that I miss, I, I, I was teaching, I'm, I'm not giving a, a regular courses, but I give, uh, s some people join in the seminars. Uh, I didn't give very many seminars, I run seminars, but uh, uh, for instance, what I miss is the eye contact. Now, even if you, if the people, um, eye contacts are very, at least for me, are very important because that, that's a kind of feedback, even if there is no uh, uh, other feedback, I think it's important feedback of how the uh, class is going on and what's the, to what extent I'm uh, reaching the, my audience. But uh, the problem with I, even if you insist that everybody will put on their camera, uh, it's, it's still not not an eye contact because, for instance, just for the very simple. Sorry. Of course. The, yeah. Yeah. Because in order to look at uh, you have to look at the camera, not at the person. You, you look at the camera, not the person, and, and, and many people, if you talk about students, I don't know, even know when they, uh, they look at me or actually look at their computer screen and doing something else. By the way, in the classroom, when you see people look at something else, I, I, I don't mind if they look at something else, but I know that they look at something else. Here, I don't even know that. So... Uh, but sometimes, it's, it's sometimes it's better not to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but, Guys, you know, should I, I stop this recording or not? Yeah, yeah, no, sure. Because no, I think maybe, this is a very nice discussion, yeah, but I just didn't about, know. Did, I, I would is suggest everybody that, uh, aware? We should, no, uh, it, it, it is part of this. It's, uh, I don't know. If, um, okay, Andres is the boss of Zoom, so we, we continue. No, no, no. no, no, no you're, you're, you're the boss. But of I, the, I think also we should, uh, 
keep, keep a few minutes to move uh, away from the technology and go and make a nice <laughs> cup of coffee. Yeah, but everybody has their hospital. Let me just inform us. And Miriam should continue, continue this conversation in Tel Aviv. <laughs> Yeah. No, I, I suggest that we, we, I just stop the camera. We are finishing our isolation in, uh, in the end of this week, but... Very good.